Hello, everyone. Welcome to the biometric legal session. I'll give you a brief introduction to who I am. Uh, I'm Chris Heideck. I'm an attorney at Microsoft. Uh, I'm in privacy and regulatory affairs. And I, so that means I, I mainly do privacy and data protection work. Um, and one of the areas I work on is, is biometrics. And uh, so this is going to be a kind of a biometric legal session. Um, I, I emphasize legal because this is gonna be kind of focused on something that we've done recently, which is kind of designing a review process for biometric solutions that um, try to enable those solutions while, while mitigating risk. So I'm not gonna delve into the security pros and cons of biometric solutions versus other solutions. Uh, I'm not gonna to try to sell anyone on using any Microsoft biometrics. Um, rather, hopefully this session will help folks devise a framework for reviewing and tailoring biometric solutions so that you can launch them wherever you work um, with a reasonable degree of risk. And I say reasonable degree of risk because uh, in the current legal landscape, as I'm sure many of you know, there isn't a, uh, there aren't, there aren't many scenarios that are going to involve uh, no risk. Um, so just to talk about the agenda for a second, I'm going to talk about a little bit of the current legal regimes. Um, many of you probably know about many of these regimes, but I thought it'd be helpful to set a base on, on the primary biometric legal regimes. And then the, the meat of the presentation will be talk about the, the next two topics, which are you know, kind of strategies for compliance across regimes, how to create a scalable and global biometric solution, and what's happening in courtrooms and legislatures today, and what's likely to happen over the next year. Um, so I will start um, it with the current legal regimes in the United States. Um, and there are currently three biometric specific laws of general applicability, Washington State, Texas, and Illinois. Uh, and I sit in Washington State, so I'll start with Washington State. And Washington State, the, the biometric law in Washington State, there's a few, but the, the, main, the, main general one, the, the main one of general applicability prohibits enrolling a biometric identifier in a database for a commercial purpose without obtaining consent or providing notice or instituting a mechanism to prevent subsequent reuse of the identifier. I'm not going to get uh, into all, all the nuances of the definition, but a few keys are, of the law, but a few keys. Uh, first, the law, is, as I tried to emphasize, is flexible on notice versus consent. And it explicitly provides that there's a choice between notice and consent, and that choice is context dependent. Um, Second, the law is triggered only when a biometric identifier is enrolled in a database. There's a lot of use cases that don't involve enrollment, um, and we'll talk about more about we'll talk more about them later. Uh, third, uh, Washington State biometric law doesn't have a private right of action, and there has been limited, if any, enforcement by the Washington Attorney General to date. Uh, so there's few resources for interpretation outside the law itself. Um, then we'll move to, I'll do Texas next as I'm a former resident of Texas. Um, but the, the Texas law is, is somewhat similar to the Illinois law, which I'll talk about in a second, but it's the Texas law that says that you can't capture a biometric identifier for a commercial purpose uh, without notice and consent. So a little different from Washington. And then once possessed, you uh, cannot disclose it to a third party without consent or an exception. Um, there's few exceptions uh, that are uh, generally helpful, but there is one that um, is useful for financial institutions if, if it's the biometric identifiers to complete a financial transaction. The other exceptions include uh, kind of unique scenarios like disclosing biometric data in response to a court order. Um, I, I, again, I'm not gonna get too many of the specifics of the Texas law, but it's brief and it doesn't define many of its terms. For example, there's no definition of capture, like what is capturing a biometric identifier. Um, but the Texas law does de define biometric identifier to include a record of hand or face geometry, uh, and which is similar to BIPA, which we'll talk about in a second, but it doesn't explain or provide context about what a record of hand or face geometry is or what that encompasses. Um, so is that a picture of a hand? Is it what about notes that fingers are a certain length? Uh, what about, or is it only something that allows for automated comparison uh, for identification or authentication? Uh, similar to Washington, the Texas law does not have a private right of action. Uh, we haven't seen public enforcement of the Texas law beyond a few articles that the Texas Attorney General was investigating Facebook in the wake of Facebook's biometric settlement, um, class action settlement. settlement. Uh, but the articles have just indicated investigating, and at least publicly, we don't know the, the conclusion of those, or at least I don't. Um, 
The most, the one everyone talks about in the United States is Illinois, the Biometric Information Privacy Act or BIPA, as it's known for short. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit more time on BIPA just because it's the the one with the most teeth in the United States. Um, at, a, at a high level, BIPA requires written consent for the collection of biometric identifiers and biometric information. Um, it creates two definitions, biometric identifiers and biometric information. And all of the obligations in BIPA apply equally to both. So the need for two definitions is somewhat unclear. Um, but getting into them for a second, biometric identifiers, BIPA provides an exhaustive list, and that includes retina or iris scan, fingerprint, voice print, and a scan of hand or face geometry. Uh, there's numerous exceptions, including things de derived from writing samples and from photographs. Um, and then biometric information as compared to biometric identifier is any info based on a biometric identifier and used to identify an individual. And importantly, the definition of biometric information includes the phrase and used to identify an individual, uh, but the definition of biometric identifier does not. So one of the questions that has arisen in litigation and just for practitioners is, uh, does the law intentionally create two definitions, impose obligations on them equally, but require unique identification or authentication for just one of the definitions? And, and maybe. Um, some plaintiffs are arguing just that, and defendants, of course, are asserting the opposite. And defendants' arguments, uh, their main arguments have kind of fallen in two camps, which is um, the first is the, the term itself is biometric identifier. So uh, how could uh, identifiers in the defined term, how could it apply to non-identifiable information? Um, and then the other arguments defend defendants are making is that the legislative intent section of the statute um, seems to only be concerned with uniquely identifiable biometric information. Uh, for example, the legislative intent section states that unlike other unique identifiers, unlike other unique identifiers, biometric identifiers are biologically unique to the individual. And that seems to suggest that the legislature was concerned predominantly with biometrics for unique identification. Um, Let's talk about the applicability of BIPA for a second. It applies to private entities and all requirements apply equally to all private entities. So there's no distinction between controllers or processors or entities with first party relationships and service providers or platforms. Um, so talking about backing up to the requirements of BIPA, one of the main requirements is obtaining written consent. So it can be tough to make sense of who should obtain consent in scenarios where um, there is a more multiple entities involved in the processing of the of the biometric um, information. And of course, you can spell that out via contract uh, between the entities that are all involved in the processing. Uh, you know, entity X should should obtain consent. But in the event of a class action, that contract between the relevant entities isn't going to help the party escape the class action. All it will do is provide some recourse for that entity that didn't have the contractual obligation to obtain consent, provide some recourse for that entity to um, you know, recoup damages from the entity that was supposed to obtain consent after the class action. Um, comprehensive privacy legislation is becoming more common in the United States. It started with the CCPA and the CCPA has a definition of biometric information and it's an interesting definition. Um, and I'll just kind of read it for a second so people uh, can hear it. Uh, but it's biometric information means an individual's physiological, biological, or behavioral characteristics, including an individual's DNA, that can be used singly or in combination with, with each other or with other identifying data to establish individual identity. And then it provides a, a list of examples of biometric information. And it says biometric information includes, but is not limited to, imagery of the iris, retina, fingerprint, face, hand, palm, vein patterns, voice recordings, from which an identifier template, such as a face print, a minutia template or a voice print can be extracted. Um, and so this use of can be ex used and can be extracted language is really interesting in CCPA. Um, and so if you can create a facial template from a photo, but you don't, the CCPA seems to suggest that that is still biometric data. Um, and the, the, the teeth of the CCPA is a little bit unknown because it creates this definition of biometric data, but then it doesn't uh, have any requirements on biometric data uh, outside of personal data. So whether that definition has any like real world Im impact yet, we're not sure. Uh, 
Um, but then Virginia, following California, you know, imp implemented a comprehensive privacy law, which probably many of you are aware of. And uh, it has a different definition of biometric data from the CCPA. And the Virginia definition is biometric data means data generated by automatic measurements of an individual's biological characteristics, such as a fingerprint, voice print, eye retinas, eye retinas, irises, or other unique biological patterns or characteristics that are used to identify a specific individual. So personally, I like the Virginia definition a lot better for two reasons. The first is it requires automatic measurements. So things like we had the capacity to do something but didn't are, are not biometric data. And also things like John Doe walks slowly, which could be considered biometric data under the CCPA, is not biometric data under the Virginia law because there's no automatic measurements. Um, and it avoids the can be used language. It avoids the can be, the capacity argument. So rather to be biometric data, the data must be used for unique identification. This takes a lot of the squishiness about capability and capacity out of the equation. It focuses on the reality of the actual and current use. Um, and this capacity versus present use debate is something, um, I, I don't know how many people here are you know, privacy lawyers or data protection lawyers, but it's something we've seen in other contexts. So if anyone's dealt with the Telephone Consumer Protection Act over the last 15 years, you know there's been tension regarding the definition of an auto dialer. Is an auto dialer something that has the capacity to generate um, and dial random numbers, even if it's not used in that capacity, or is something an auto dialer only if it's used to generate and dial random numbers? So we're, we're seeing that same kind of capacity versus present use argument come up in biometric laws. Um, many cities and states also have enacted biometric laws. I won't get into them in detail, but most of them focus only on government and law enforcement use of biometrics or, or facial recognition. Many of them are focused on facial recognition. At least one applies to the private sector, however, and that's the law in Portland, Oregon. And Portland's law interestingly bans uh, the facial recognition tech in places of public, in places of public accommodation. Um, so, and similar to BIPA, it contains a private right of action and statutory damages. Uh, so we may see uh, a lot of litigation under that law as well. It's it's only been enacted in the last since January, um, and consent, interesting, is not an exception or, or a basis for processing the biometrics. Unlike BIPA, Portland's law is a ban, uh, though there are a few exceptions, such as using facial recognition for verification purposes for BYOD or you know using work issued devices. Um, but it's a it's a ban. It's not a requirement to get consent. Consent is irrelevant. Um, and so next, I'll talk about the current legal regime in, in Europe. Um, of course, the GDPR, has, which has been around for a few years now, um, addresses biometric data, and it has a definition which is different from the CCPA and different from Virginia and different from BIPA and different from Texas and different from Washington. Um, and, it mean, and it states the biometric data is, is personal data resulting from specific technical processing relating to the physical, physiological, or behavioral characteristics of a natural person, which allow or confirm the unique identification of that natural person, such as facial images or DNA. So very similar to the concept of automatic measurements in the Virginia law, the GDPR requires some type of specific technical processing. So our example of John Doe walks slowly isn't biometric data. There's no specific technical processing in that, in that data. Um, different DPAs have issued guidance uh, um, about processing biometric data under the GDPR. Perhaps the most interesting, um, and maybe the one that's given the most uh, thought and, and, and length to it is the German, DPA, German DPAs through the DSK, which is kind of the body of all the German DPAs. Um, I'm not going to go in depth on, on, the, on the paper, but uh, they provides a lot of scenarios with examples and then the German DPA's guidance on those examples. And it, it's really interesting if, if um, you haven't read it. And another interesting aspect to it was two or three of the German DPA's did not vote to issue it. Uh, they don't issue dissenting statements or anything like that, but it wasn't unanimous paper by the German DPA's, which is interesting um, on you know, what, presumably there's some conclusions in there that two or three of the DPA's did not agree with. Um, uh, then getting outside of Europe, I'll talk about the kind of the rest of the world. I talked about US and Europe a little bit. I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna kind of briefly touch on some of the interesting developments outside US and rest of the world. I'm not gonna try to provide the legal regimes everywhere else, but um, India's most recent data protection bill bans processing biometric data without approval by the government. Um, it's exactly how that ban will work if this law gets passed or the exact biometric data is somewhat unclear. 
but it's a really interesting position in the India data protection bill, um, which has been in the works for a few years now. Uh, the Canadian DPAs recently released a really interesting joint investigation into Clearview. Uh, Clearview, as you may have heard, had been accused of creating facial templates of people via publicly available pictures on the internet. And Clearview provided a service that allowed law enforcement and certain other governmental actors to submit a picture of an individual. And Clearview would provide back other images of the individual that Clearview found on the internet, plus metadata associated with the, with the pictures. And uh, I'm just gonna highlight one really interesting uh, sentence from the joint investigation by the Canadian DPAs. And it was Clearview should have obtained express opt-in consent before it collected the images of any individual in Canada. So note that the report doesn't say that Clearview should have obtained consent before creating a facial vector or a facial template. It says Clearview should have obtained consent before it even obtained the images, before it clicked download on, on, the, on the images that it you know, scraped from publicly available websites. Um, and this seems to blur any distinctions between raw data, images, um, video, audio of people talking. Um, and derived biometric data, such as facial vectors or facial templates. Uh, but, you know, perhaps I'm taking this one paragraph of the investigation, and, you know, out of, out too much. I'm reading too much into it and taking a little bit of, out of context. But I thought that was a very interesting paragraph from the, from the Canadians. Um, so uh, this is mainly what I'm going to try to walk through. We're going to kind of get to what we've done over the past, I don't know, year or so to try to reconcile all these biometric laws and provide some method for reviewing solutions and products and services that Microsoft tries to create. Um, and again, this is focused on the legal side. So we've also made a bunch of policy decisions like whether to sell facial recognition tech to police. And I'm not gonna get into those policy decisions. Uh, you know, I'm not on the policy team and I haven't been involved in those discussions. So I wouldn't have anything intelligent or helpful to say, um, but, so step one, what we did first was we, we created, you know, we looked at our existing review systems and frameworks and just looked for the Delta. So if you work in an org of moderate size or, or bigger, you likely have a framework around processing personal data uh, that you created in response to the GDPR, the CCPA or whatever relevant uh, law in your jurisdiction. But if not, it's certainly very feasible to start fresh. And I don't think starting fresh is bad or it means you're late. It likely means you've had other priorities or, you know, you've had got different circumstances and now you have the opportunity to create something relevant for your size, your market, your processing and the other circumstances that, that, you, that surround you. Um, so what, what I discovered first is that we needed a definition of biometric data to, to enable the fact finding. So like rather than start with engineering and ask, hey, what biometric data are you processing? We needed to give engineering a def the engineering teams a definition that they could that we said this is biometric data. You know, can you tell us what you know all the places where you're processing this biometric data? Um, and and like it's it, it was a little bit odd to me because I thought oh we'll just we'll, we'll just start with asking people every everyone what they're doing, and it's it became it quickly became untenable because different engineering groups have different ideas of what biometric data is. So we needed a definition to drive the fact finding. Um, and the definition was tricky to create due to the difference in the laws we've discussed. Like CCPA has this capacity um, uh, component to it and most of the other laws do not. So we were slightly overbroad and I think it's likely worth being slightly overbroad in your definition, particularly due to the sharp teeth of BIPA. Um, but it may be tolerable to your risk appetite depending on who you are to exclude certain processing that could include biometric data. For example, as I just talked about, the CCPA has this capacity component, but you might not include the capacity component in your definition and just worry about places where you're actually creating you know, a, a, a vector. You're actually deriving something from the raw underlying data. Um, and until this capacity component of CCPA's definition gains more force, either via regs or laws or judicial decisions, it, it might be tolerable to exclude that from your definition. But I advise against absorbing any BIPA risks at the definitional stage. It's just make sure your definition captures all the BIPA. You can take other BIPA risks later. You may want to take other BIPA risks later on. You may not want to, but I would advise try to avoid taking any BIPA risks at, at just this like first step. Um, and so the, the next thing we did after creating this definition was 
to discover our uses. And, and when I say discover uses, I don't mean like we had no idea what we're doing. Like we have privacy teams, they're reviewing, um, you know, all processing, all personal data processing. But we had this like special project created to like, when, when biometric legis- litigation was really taken off, we had this special project created. It's like, let's make sure that all, we've got a good handle out of our biometric data processing and we know what we're doing. Um, so, you know, circulate the definition to engineering teams, ask for feedback, encourage questions and feedback. The engineering team should send back descriptions to their scenarios that meet the definition. And then so you, see, so you read the descriptions and scenarios. This likely, this involves a, a, some back and forth and be prepared to spend some time understanding what the team is doing and why they're doing it. Um, but after reviewing your scenarios, you'll have a much better idea of the processing your entity is engaged in. Maybe it's just fingerprint scanning tech uh, provided by a vendor to access a secure building. Maybe that's all the biometric processing you're doing. Maybe you're at the forefront of creating new biometric techniques across the gamut of use cases. Uh, but in either event, you'll have a really good idea of the amount of work you have after seeing the brief descriptions of all the scenarios that meet your definition. Um, so then after, the, after you get your use cases, uh, what we did is create subcategories and, uh, of, of biometric use cases that were common. And so, for example, um, in, in like the, the gamut of facial techniques, you start with facial recognition, which is uh, like verifying that Chris is Chris or John is John or, or you know, Jane is Jane, um, that's comparing a facial template against another facial template to identify or authenticate that person. Uh, but that's on the one end. And on the other end of the spectrum is technology that is involved, you know, what a lot of people refer to as facial detection, where facial detection is just, uh, uh, you know, biometric processing to determine whether that, that's a human face, but it has no idea. So it's taking measurements and there's technical processing of the image, but it's not uh, identifying the person or figuring out, it can't even distinguish between person A and person B. All it can, all it does is specific technical processing to figure out that there's a face. And you see this all over the place. Like, you know, if you pull out your um, smartphone and open up whatever camera app you use, then you try to take a picture, you'll see a bounding box around the people's faces in the, in the picture you're about to snap. And that bounding box is using facial detection technology to detect those faces. And it might, you know, um, focus in on those faces, adjust the lighting, because often when people are taking pictures, they want uh, the, the faces of the people they're taking a picture of to, um, you know, be, be well-focused, be the highlight of the picture. Um, and then, but there's a whole gamut of activities on that spectrum between facial recognition or verification or identification on one end and facial detection on the other. And these are things like facial character in the middle, there's things like facial characterization, which is a, you know, a one step beyond facial detection, which is, okay, well, there's a specific technical processing on the image to detect the human face. And then the next step is, well, what are some characteristics of that human face? Like, is this a male or a female? Is this a um, person in their 20s or a person in their 70s? Um, Is this person look angry or sad or what's their emotional state? And, you know, companies might use facial characterization for any number of things. Like the classic example is in the retail context. A retailer might want to understand the aggregate demographics of their customers. Um, doesn't know, doesn't really care who came in, but the retailer might be very interested if 80% of their uh, customers are angry when they walk into the store. Like, why are our customers so angry when they walk in store? Or why are they so angry when they walk into this one part of the store? Um, And that, that like spectrum for different facial technologies is not unique to face. It's, it applies, you know, it's in the voice context as well. So voice detection, you know, we're on a Zoom meeting right now. Uh, I, I don't know anything about Zoom's tech, but it, it, very well, a lot of voice software detects a human voice and it may detect the human voice, pro- apply some specific technical processing to detect that voice for very, you know, uh, to make the tech better, whatever kind of product or service they're offering, like to minimize ambient noise. If there's a dog barking in the background to minimize that noise, and maximize and focus on the, the human voice. Um, and then of course there's you know voice recognition and voice authentication and verification on the other end of the spectrum, like my voice is my password. Um, and in the middle there's speaker diarization, which is you know grouping, grouping um, people by their voice. So it's a it's a you know there's a, a broad spectrum of things and you'll want to create subcategories for um, the different biometric scenarios you're you're involved in. Um, and 
so the the next step is to create varying requirements based on uh, for different buckets based on the sophistication and identifiability of your biometric scenarios. You may only need one bucket, or you may need twenty, but the buckets will be separated by a handful of factors. Um, so the first, the biggest factor, most likely, is unique identification, yes or no. Um, and as we just talked about, think about face re facial recognition versus facial detection. Facial recognition, which is, involves unique identification, is going to fall in a higher risk bucket than facial detection. But even within facial recognition, you may want different, different buckets if the facial recognition is one-to-one -one matching or one-to-n matching. So, you know, one-to-one -one matching is like using uh, facial recognition for to log into a, a, a device. The device only stores one facial template, the owner of the device. And all it does is match whoever tries to uh, look at that device to unlock it does this facial template match the facial template we have stored on the device? So that's just one-to-one -one matching. And, and, but there's also one-to-in matching, which could be you know, a camera on a sidewalk that's taking a facial template of everybody that walks by to match against the database of 10,000 criminals. And it, in those scenarios, you're, you, you know, it's a riskier scenario, of course, um, unlawful in, in a lot of places about well, uh, you know, you're, you're matching every single um, data subject against a database of 10,000 templates as opposed to just uh, one template. Um, and then of course, your ge the geography you operate in or where you sell your product or where you're located is another um, uh, fat pivot that is gonna, uh, that's gonna factor into your risk buckets. And um, if you operate only in Ohio, your requirement's gonna look a lot different than if you're, than if you're global. Um, another, uh, risk factors, are you a controller or a processor? As we've discussed though, a lot of US laws don't recognize this distinction. Um, so that, I think that that is an important distinction and will um, have impact on your risk buckets, but it's not explicitly provided for in every, in every law regarding biometrics in the US. Um, so the, the next step is to design your requirements uh, along those risk pivots we just talked about. So the first requirement you know, that we did was like a lawful basis. And so if you're doing unique identification, you're likely going to need to use consent. Now there are exceptions in various places around the world. Um, but generally for unique identification, consent is going to be the most common lawful basis. Lawful basis. It, uh, other lawful bases are going to be available in other situations though. For example, legitimate interest might work in situations that do not involve unique identification. Like let's say you have a camera app um, for mobile devices and the camera app detects human faces using automated measures of specific technical processing, automated measures, again, from the Virginia law, specific, specific technical processing from the GDPR to put a rectangle around the faces and highlight the faces, adjust the lighting, et cetera, like we just talked about. Um, the app doesn't identify just to, just to text human faces. Legitimate interest may very well be a very reasonable basis to use in that circumstance, you know, rather than trying to get consent from whomever is in the picture to to consent to the bounding box around their face. Um, another requirement you're gonna have to deal with, with, with biometrics is retention and destruction. Many biometric laws have peculiar retention requirements. Um, and so you're gonna need requirements for how long you can retain the biometric data. Um, a lot of processing though, of course, you don't need to retain any of the biometric data. For example, face detecting for a mobile, um, for a camera app, you don't need to retain anything uh, you know, after after the uh, picture is taken. Um, another requirement you'll likely want to have is disclosures to third party. Under BIPA, even disclosures to vendors who act on your behalf may require consent. It's not clear that there is an exception to the consent requirement under BIPA um, to, to even pass biometrics to a vendor who's operating you know, strictly on your behalf. Um, but again, you know, try to avoid redundant or duplicative or contradictory requirements as compared to your normal policies or practices on personal data. So like I said, you know, or a little bit earlier is you probably already got some uh, framework for uh, how to evaluate personal data processing. You don't need to create a second, for, you don't need to create like a redundant framework. You just want to, you, you just want to add, um, address the delta for biometric requirements that may have, um, that you may not already have. Um, so uh, let's talk about some of the, the risks that might require, that might arise. There, there's a new, there's numerous of them. And I'll discuss a few of the common risks. So as we've talked about, particularly in the US, many of these state laws do not distinguish between processors and controllers. As we discussed earlier, this can make compliance plan really difficult for processors. The lack of distinction doesn't really have a significant impact on controllers. 
or more accurately, the party with the relationship with the data subject. The controller generally is in a position to obtain consent or whatever is required from the data subject, but the processor is in a much more difficult situation. Um, as we discussed, the processor may be able to shift responsibility to the controller via contract, but that shifting won't help the processor win a motion to dismiss in the face of a consumer class action. It will merely provide a hook to recoup damages and costs from the controller after the fact. Um, another common risk is bystanders or data subjects who are not, who are not the intended target of the biometric solution. Um, if you're deploying biometrics outside of a controlled space, like outside of a, a warehouse where you count money or something, uh, the risk of bystanders will almost always be present. And if you think about a photo app that allows consumers to quickly sort photos using facial grouping technology, the tech allows the user to quickly see all the faces that match person A, uh, perhaps the user's spouse, parent, or child. But what about all the pictures of person A at the beach, museum, or Times Square? You know, the photo apps have to create a facial template of everyone in the picture in order to find all the pictures of person A in the album. Um, the facial templates of the bystanders likely are ephemeral, you know, the app doesn't store them for more than a second to, to compare against the template of person A, but they are created. And so do you, do you get consent for those people? And that's a very different category from someone who intentionally submits themselves to a fingerprint scanner or a palm reader to clock in or pay. Like if you have a fingerprint scanner to clock in or pay, somebody could come use it that's not the intended um, person that that it's not the intended data subject that hasn't consented, but that person, you know, intentionally went up there and used the fingerprint scanner. You know, these folks were just at a museum and the example we were just talking about, these folks are just at a museum or a beach or Times Square and someone unknown to them captured them in a photo. Um, that person's photo app then created a facial, an ephemeral facial template uh, of all the bystanders. Um, so the photo app could push the consent requirement to the user via terms and conditions don't use this facial grouping feature uh, unless you get consent from everybody in the photo. Um, and that may be the most feasible solution, at least if we want the technology to be enabled, but is the user really gonna go obtain consent for everyone in the photo? No, no one's gonna walk around Times Square and ask everyone to consent. Um, and perhaps consent is not something we think should be required from these folks. Uh, but if the picture is taken in Illinois, some, you know, replace Times Square with Michigan Avenue, or perhaps some other jurisdiction, there's, there's certainly risk without, without consent from the, from the individuals. Um, there's, of course, other risks that you'll discover, but it might be worth talking about some of the actions that you can use to mitigate those risks. And so one of the biggest ones is device side processing. As much as possible, perform the biometric functions on the edge of the user's device. If you've got a camera in a warehouse performing some coarse biometrics for security purposes, keep the biometric processing and the results local on the camera, on the edge device in the warehouse. You know, don't upload or store or use the biometrics in the cloud if at all possible. And obviously it's gonna depend on your tech and whoever your you know, vendor's tech is, or if you're the vendor, you know, it's gonna depend on your tech. Um, but, but in the context of the Photos Act, we just talked about, the risk is likely a whole lot lower if the facial templates never leave that user's, app, that, that user's device. Um, Use course techniques. Don't use facial recognition when facial detection will suffice for your objectives. You know, many of these go without saying, but don't retain, retain templates if you don't need them. Don't retain any biometric data if you don't need it. But even consider dropping aggregated learnings if of no minimal value, particularly in Illinois. I mean, BIPA defines biometric information to include any info based on an individual's biometric identifier. Um, I, I won't and can't intelligently get into conflicts of laws issues, but geofencing like geofencing likely is an ob option for some of your products. And, and geofencing doesn't necessarily mean wholly excluding riskier jurisdictions such as Illinois. It may mean having different settings or consent experiences for different jurisdictions. So just adjusting a toggle, you know, what the default state of a toggle in certain jurisdictions versus other jurisdictions. Um, th the next step is determine reviewers. More than likely, there's going to be residual risk, despite whatever mitigations you implement with respect to many of your solutions. The reviewers will need to assess that risk and give a go or no-go determination. Um, so let's talk a little bit about BIPA litigation trends, getting kind of back to away from the, the process of creating this framework for reviewing your biometric solutions and talk about uh, specific BIPA litigation trends. Um, so now that we're done with the how-to section, thought I'd give some thoughts on some current litigation trends and make some probably shaky predictions. Um, although BIPA litigation has exploded over the past five years or so, 
we're still somewhat in the infancy of BIPA litigation. There's lots of opinions and decisions on standing, but there's still a relative dearth of decisions interpreting the substantive requirements of the statute. Like what are biometric identifiers and biometric information? Many of the lawsuits concern items clearly within the definition, such as fingerprint scanners to clock employees at, in and out. But we're starting to see cases that may help define the outer boundaries of the terms. Uh, for example, there have been in our cases percolating regarding voice prints, which are considered biometric identifiers under BIPA, but BIPA doesn't define or provide any context regarding what's a voice print. So we're seeing cases against voice activated assistants alleging that their tech involves voice prints. And these likely will turn on the the facts for the specific assistance, but they could be helpful in determining what is a voice print. Similarly, for scans and hand, of face and hand geometry, also included in the term biometric identifier in BIPA, we're starting to see cases that test these definitions. So we're starting to see cases alleging technology like facial grouping is a scan of facial geometry. Uh, facial grouping is the tech we just talked about that allows you know, users to group images of people by face. The app creates an ephemeral template of everyone in the user's album and then shows only photos that match the subject the user wanted to see. The app has no idea who the person is, although it might let the user label the person, but the label could be anything. But the app does create a template of every, of every person in the album. You know, is that a scan of facial geometry or does BIPA require some level of identification or knowledge of who the data subject is? And some of you, particularly in Europe, might assert that any automated comparison of facial templates, regardless of whether the templates are processed ephemerally, ephemerally or the company can link more info about the data subject to the temp template is unique identification. And I think most European DPAs have that view uh, based on the EDPB guidance on processing video data from 2020. Um, so let's take the example one step further away from identification. What about facial characterization? The EDPB guidance indicates that that is not unique identification but would it be considered a scan of facial geometry under BIPA? These types of questions take some time to resolve via litigation, but there's beginning to be cases that will help uh, folks provide substantive guidance on, on those types of questions. Um, another interesting line of cases is the validity of the exclusions of photographs um, from the definition of biometric information and biometric identifiers. A handful of district courts have helped, and some of you may think this, this is done, this, this question is over, but I, I, don't, I don't think so. A, a handful of district courts have held this exclusion does not apply to techniques to derive biometrics from online or digital photos, but there's certainly textual support for the argument and defendants continue to make it. Um, so a favorable decision for defendants from, a, for defendants, a favorable decision for defendants, of course, from a higher court could really dampen biometric class actions focused on online photos. Uh, we've talk, talked briefly about service providers, vendors, and processors, and whether they're subject to BIPA requirements. It's a hot question for many suppliers of biometric technology. As BIPA doesn't contain that distinction between controllers and processors, there's certainly an argument that processors are responsible for obtaining consent from data subjects, even if the processors have no relationship with the data subject and simply take instructions from the controller. Um, the early decisions we've seen so far from district courts uh, seem to focus, probably unsurprisingly, on the text of the statute. For example, the consent obligation under BIPA applies when a private entity collects, captures, purchases, um, receives through trade, or otherwise obtains biometric data. Uh, at least one district court has focused on whether the vendor took an active step. Now, active step is not in the, you know, the text of BIPA, but trying to figure out what that, that interpret that means, the court try to look at whether the vendor took an active step to obtain users biometric data as opposed to receiving it passively. And uh, another court indicated that service provider could comply with BIPA by contractually requiring its customer to obtain consent from data subjects. But I don't think that actually ensures compliance. It just provides an opportunity for recourse as we talked about, in early, as we talked about earlier. In any event, I wouldn't draw too many conclusions yet other than I think it's unlikely U.S. courts will draw a bright line controller and processor distinction. I think that's a solution that would, that would have to come from the legislature um, as opposed to the courts. Um, so to talk about a few forward-looking developments, I, I won't spend too much time here, but I thought it'd be worthwhile to note a few forward-looking forward developments. Um, biometrics used to be the purview of trial attorneys. Sure, there was the odd guidance from a European DPA here or there, but Clearview changed that. Uh, governments and regulators are getting heavily involved around the world. Um, I, I don't want to spend too much more time talking about facial grouping, which I've already talked about that a lot. But um, a recent FTC enforcement action, I think, against Ever Album demonstrates the FTC's increasing attention toward biometrics. 
And one of the very interesting components of that uh, settlement, as reiterated in certain commissioners' accompanying statements, was that every album was required to delete models derived from the allegedly unlawful biometric processing. It wasn't just required to delete the raw data or the biometric data. It was required to delete its IP, its models for creating, using, and processing biometric data. Uh, this requirement, I think, will gain traction in future settlements, particularly those involving biometric data. And it could be much more impactful to companies um, than you know, a monetary fine of almost any amount. Um, there have been a flurry of state laws. At a high level, the laws come in two forms, those that specifically regulate biometrics and those that are comprehensive privacy laws, like the GDPR, CCPA, or Virginia. Um, Personally, I like comprehensive privacy laws. I think they're preferable uh, for ease of understanding and accessibility. So people can go find the laws and read them and interpret them. Um, and, private, and comprehensive privacy laws can always have provisions that apply only to biometrics or only to special categories or sensitive personal data. But despite my personal preference, I think we're going to continue to see both types of laws proposed and enacted. Um, despite the intense focus on the CCPA and BIPA, there are competing models for comprehensive and biometric focused privacy laws. Uh, and I think we may see some of those competing models um, advanced and enacted. I mean, Virginia enacted a comprehensive privacy law recently and Washington state has been pushing a comprehensive law for years, but thus far at least it's died in the legislature every year. But, and on the biometric spe specific side, Texas and Washington state both have biometric specific statutes. They don't get as much attention as BIPA because BIPA has far more litigation. But in debating between which model to enact, you know, legislators, I think, should look past the headlines for statutes that protect individual privacy while providing companies with clear rules to follow. You know, opacity is not good for data subjects or businesses. Voluminous litigation can be a sign that data subjects are enforcing their rights against companies that are disregarding those rights, or voluminous litigation can be a sign of an opaque statute with, start, with sharp teeth. Um, a higher level debate that's being had in some policy and governmental arenas is whether government should permit biometrics at all. Uh, at least biometrics that involve unique identification. And I think the, the opening two sentences in former Commissioner Chopra's statement accompanying the Ever Album settlement are really noteworthy. He wrote, today's facial recognition technology is fundamentally flawed and reinforces harmful biases. I support efforts to enact moratoria or otherwise severely restrict its use. These sentences have nothing to do with the alleged deceptive conduct underpinning the FTC's enforcement action. Rather, they're a call to ban. <clears throat> probably temp I mean, temporarily, facial recognition technology as a whole. And former Commissioner Chopra is not the only person who feels this way. M many do. And there's a debate happening around whether biometric law should simply impose a ban on their use until some indeterminate point in the future when policymakers or the public are assuaged that their benefits, uh, the benefits of the biometric technology, facial recognition particularly, outweigh their costs. Um, this is just kind of some highlights of relevant litigation and enforcement that we've seen. Uh, uh, you know, the, I wanted to highlight some of these, some of the headlines. Um, many of you are probably familiar with Facebook's $650 million biometric settlement. Um, I, we talked about the Elver album, uh, FTC enforcement action, the Rosenbach for Six Flags. That's a reference to the Illinois Supreme Court decision under BIPA, which held that a violation of the statute is a cognizable harm that can be sued for. There doesn't, the plaintiffs don't have to show some additional injury. Um, and the, the bottom two uh, screenshots show kind of the diverging paths that are of, of some, um, the results in cases against service providers or vendors that don't have the, the direct relationship with data subjects. So you're seeing uh, like the, the BIPA class claims advance against a company that provides biometric timekeeping for uh, timekeeping devices to employers. That was against Kronos. Data subjects sued the, the provider of the timekeeping device directly, um, and Kronos lost a motion to dismiss. And then, kind of contradictorily, uh, Amazon and Pendrop motions to dismiss were granted in a voice print suit. Um, the, the, now, the reason it's not it, the courts, you know, there's different facts, but the Amazon suit was dismissed because it you know, uh, didn't have sufficient con connection to Illinois. But Amazon was providing a a, uh, a, a voice recognition service as a processor, as a vendor to uh, another company, John Hancock and uh, Amazon won a motion to dismiss. So just kind of a, a highlight of all the, of the differences that are happening at the, at the district court level, at least right now, the things are moving to higher courts um, in, in BIPA litigation against vendors and service providers.
And um, just lap, lastly, before we wrap up, just wanted to give you a summary of like the citations. I think al almost everything I referenced in this presentation is uh, um, linked to and highlighted here. But if I mentioned something that was not, you know, feel free to reach out to me um, and I will be happy to provide a site. Uh, oh, yeah. So I see one um, uh, possible amendments to BIPA. So there have been a couple of legislative proposals to change BIPA. And one of the ones that I think got the most attention was a proposal that would have kind of reined in the litigation, the class action nature of BIPA. My understanding, and I don't, this is not from any kind of discussions with um, legislators in, in Illinois or anything. My understanding is those, those proposals have all died on the vine. And it's unlikely, at least in this legislative session, that we are going to see any significant amendments to BIPA. Um, I'm not saying that, that they won't happen in the future, but I think it's unlikely that they're going to happen uh, at this late of legislative session in Illinois. Um, but that's just based on reading articles, not, not on any kind of inside information from I Illinois legislators. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So one question, one of the other questions is, do you think there could be a trend um, for those laws to be closer to each other as, as the use of biometrics is growing? I, I do think there's, there's um, I, I do think that's possible. So, um, to the extent, and I think this, I think this is good for for everyone, is to have a clear definition of what falls within biometrics and what doesn't. I, I think it's good for plaintiffs, and I think it's good for defendants. I think it's good for data subjects, and I think it's good for companies that are processing biometric data. And and hopefully those, and this is just my my personal opinion about how that definition will happen. But I think there is room because there aren't too too many competing definitions yet, and I think some. Some of them are much preferable to others in the minds of a, a large uh, portion of, of the populace. So uh, like California, the CCPA definition, you know, I think is um, troublesome to implement because it has this capacity um, uh, component, which is like, can you do something even if you don't? And I think that's very that's um, hopefully that does not catch on. And, you know, the CCPA, now there's the CPRA. And there's going to be the California board. Um, I, I think that definition could be amended to get rid of that capacity component. Um, and, and maybe that capacity component wasn't even like intended. So I, I think there's some ability to like, I, I do think there is some possibility that these definitions will kind of streamline into more, something that looks more like the GDPR or the Virginia law, which requires some type of automated automated processing, some type of specific technical processing, um, and you know whether there's a unique identification component or not, I think is going to be a little bit up in the air. I don't know if the laws will coalesce around that. They may coalesce around that there doesn't have to be a unique identification. I know the GDPR language kind of suggests there should be a unique identification, but then all the DPA guidance um, and the, from the individual DPAs and the EDPB states that things like facial characterization are um, biometric processing, but there's no unique identification in that scenario. Do I, okay, I see another question came in. Do I see foresee any federal legislation on biometrics? No, I don't. Um, and I don't, uh, other than, you know, perhaps other than like some situation specific biometrics, like I, you know, potentially it could be some about police or about governmental use or something like that. But I don't, I don't uh, foresee any kind of broad biometric legislation from the federal government applicable to the private sector. Um, you know, I, I think probably if asked me that question six months ago or maybe a year ago, I thought there was a good chance for some kind of federal comprehensive privacy legislation that could have included a biometrics component. But I feel like that's died. Like I feel like both um, parties are have other priorities now and federal privacy legislation um, has taken a little bit of a backseat. And I don't think it's um, a priority, a, a top priority of either party right now. Now, obviously, if President Biden came out tomorrow and said federal privacy legislation is my number one priority, that would change, uh, you know, overnight. But I don't, I don't, I don't think that, I think that's unlikely. So I think we're probably waiting a while for any type of federal privacy legislation, including federal privacy legislation uh, focused on biometrics. Somebody asked, you know, what's my personal approach to like using my own devices, uh, using biometric tech on my own devices um, in, in terms of security. Um, I, 
I, I use it. Um, I, 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 I generally, I prefer, I know I'm certainly no security expert, but I generally try to use uh, biometrics for things that post to passwords when I have that opportunity. And when it's, um, you know, a relatively reputable company, um, you know, I log in to my phone with my face. I used to log in with my thumbprint. Um, I don't have, and maybe this is just because I'm uh, not as much, I'm not a social media user or like a, I, I don't take a ton of pictures. I don't do a lot of the photo stuff with uh, biometrics, but that's not so much a hesitancy towards the biometrics as it is just kind of like personal use. Um, have there been dialogue about controlling biometrics in the context of greater accountability for police? Yeah, I think um, there certainly has been. Um, and so maybe I'm misinterpreting this question, but um, there are a lot of laws percolating, particularly at the state, state and local level, and some have already been enacted about uh, the police use of biometrics. So Washington State, for example, passed a law last year on police and uh, governmental um, use of biometrics um, and restricting its use. It's not directly applicable on the private sector, but of course, if the private sector is going to uh, try to sell some biometric solution to a government or a police, then they're only going to be interested in solutions that can comply with the Washington state law. And the Washington state, not alone in that. There's other localities and states that are passing laws like that all the time. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. I really appreciate your time. Um, you know, again, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions, chris.hydak at microsoft.com, or if you just want to chat about anything. HIDAC is H-Y-D-A-K. Um, have a great rest of your day. I appreciate your time. Bye.